This week we're going to look at learning and memory and what the information processing theory says about how we learn as humans. This will be the first of two weeks where learning and memory are discussed. Think about the following questions. When you need to remember something, how do you remember? When you go to the movies, how do you remember where you parked your car? What about when you're rushing out the door in the morning and you need to find your keys? How do you know where they are? Or when you come to a new environment like USC and you're being introduced to a lot of new people, how do you remember their names? How does our memory work? Before we jump into the latest and greatest model of our memory, let's take a look at this cartoon. What is the human brain being compared to here? That's right, a computer. The best model we have today to explain how our memory works is the information processing system. You'll also hear this be referred to as the information processing model or, like the title of our unit, the information processing theory. In this model, the mind is very much compared to a computer. Think about the times in the past that you've studied, all of the hours you've put in, the anxiety, the sweat, the tears, only to forget things the following semester or even the following day. How does our brain work like a computer? Think about what was said in the chapter that you read. For example, if we don't file our information well, we were not going to be able to find it. If we have too many things going on, the system will crash. So of course the joke is about the human mind being very similar to a computer, and in a lot of ways it really is. We do file things in our memory, but how well we file them, meaning how well they're organized with the information that we've previously learned, will determine how well and how quickly we're able to bring up the information when we need it. This cartoon really illustrates what we're going to be focusing on today, human memory and the information processing system. Let's take a closer look at the information processing theory. This is the theory that will be the foundation of everything that we learn in EDUC 140. According to the theory, there are three main components to the information processing system. They are short-term sensory store, working memory, and long-term memory. Let's take a closer look at these three components. The first component in the information processing model is the short-term sensory store. This is also referred to as a sensory memory or sensory register. This component is where all of the information first enters our mind, all of the sensory information that we're receiving from our environment. So what kind of input comes in? Think about your senses. Go way back, go back to kindergarten. How many senses do you have? Five, right? Unfortunately, that's not correct. Um, depending on the theorist that you speak to, um, there can be anywhere from 10 to even upwards of 20 different senses. We know the basic five, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. So just think about all of the information that's coming in through those basic five senses. What are you seeing right now? Where are you sitting? Are you inside or are you outside? Are you in your dorm or the library? Are there things on your desk? Do you have books and papers spread out? Or is it just your computer in front of you? What are you hearing? Is your roommate playing music? Is your phone going off? Are there other people in the library who are talking? Or do you have music of your own on in the background? What about smell? Is someone eating pizza near you? Touch, how does your chair feel? We can actually take our sense of touch and break it down into a few different parts. We can feel things that are hot, things that are cold. We feel pressure, we feel pain. We also have a sense of motion. Are you possibly listening to this as you're driving in a car or walking across campus? We also have a vestibular sense or a sense of balance. This lets us know that we are right side up and not going to fall down. So what happens to all the information in the short-term sensory store? One of two things can occur. It can either move into the working memory or it gets lost forever. This component is often referred to as a store or a register because it's not technically memory. The information moves through the short-term sensory store so quickly that it doesn't even register into our consciousness. In fact, if information is not moved into our working memory in a half a second to three seconds, it gets lost forever. Think about the last time you were walking through campus and all of the people, the buildings, the objects, the, the flags, the scenery, the plants, the trees, um, the maybe, maybe even birds or people on bikes that you were encountering. 
all of the conversations that you heard, people um, either talking loudly or whispering, maybe someone was singing or you were hearing music of your own. All of these things were coming in through your short-term sensory store. Most of these things were lost very quickly, although they all did register for a brief flash in the information processing model. Although most of the information that comes through the short-term sensory store is lost, some information does get pushed into the working memory. But how does this occur? Think about the things that you were consciously thinking about as you were walking through campus. Maybe you were listening to music of your own, or you were having a conversation with a friend. These things did enter your working memory, but how did they get there? Let's take a look at the next slide. Now pay attention. Literally, we need to pay attention in order to move things from our short-term sensory store into our working memory. What would be an example of this? First, let's go back to our little stroll across campus. You saw a lot of people, a lot of things that, as you were walking, but they all didn't catch your attention. Maybe somebody was walking who was wearing the same USC t-shirt that you were, or someone who you met previously at a Welcome Week event. This probably caught your attention and brought the information into your working memory, which is really our consciousness. What about when we're studying? Have you ever read a sentence, a paragraph, or a whole page, and you know you read it? But you get to the bottom of the page and you realize you have no idea what you just read. This is a working memory issue. What was happening is that you weren't paying attention. So everything was coming into your short-term sensory store, but because you might have been thinking about something else, maybe a conversation that you had just had or you were listening to the music or thinking about how you don't like the song that's playing, because you were attending to other information, the information that you were reading in the book wasn't coming into your working memory and being processed. So what about the information that does come into our working memory? What happens to it then? Well, there are three things that can happen. First, if we don't think it's that important, or if something else more important comes in and pushes that information out, the memory will be lost. Second, if we rehearse or repeat the information, um, such as maybe an email address that you just received um, but didn't have anywhere to write it down, if you repeat that information over and over, it will stay in our working memory for a little bit longer than normal. The third thing that can occur is that the information can go into our long-term memory. Moving information into our long-term memory is how learning actually occurs. This is information that we'll be able to retrieve at a later time. Repeating information, such as the email address that we just received, is probably not going to go into our long-term memory. We're just going to have to repeat it until we can write it down or put it into our phone or computer. Because moving information into our long-term memory is how learning occurs, this is really the gold standard of memory. This is the holy grail. This is where we want our memories to go when things are important, um, such as studying for a class or remembering someone's birthday. But how do we get information into our long-term memory? We'll get to that in a bit, but first, let's take a little bit closer look at working memory. Our working memory is our consciousness. Once we attend to information, we can think about it on a conscious level. Unfortunately, there's not that big of a capacity in our working memory. We can really only think about five to nine different things at a time. And actually, experts nowadays really think that that number is a lot lower, probably closer to four. So what this means is that our working memory has a very small capacity. But on top of having a small capacity, it also has a very short duration. The duration of the working memory is about 5 to 15 seconds. This means that if information is attended to and brought into our working memory, but something else doesn't occur, such as rehearsal or moving the information into long-term memory, the information will be lost. So think about that email address that you were trying to remember but you didn't have anywhere to write it down. You can rehearse this and keep it in your working memory for a little bit longer than five to 15 seconds. But because our working memory has a very small capacity, you wanna make sure someone doesn't come by and start talking to you while you're trying to remember and rehearse that email address. If, for example, that happens, someone comes by, asks you a question, asks you what time it is, or tries to start a whole conversation with you, what happens is the capacity is so small in our working memory that the new information coming in will actually push out the email address that you were trying to remember. And again, the memory will be lost. 
So looking back at the capacity of our working memory, the seven plus or minus two things, the five to nine things, or more like four things, that we can hold in our working memory at one time, it kind of gives the illusion that we can multitask really well. We can do maybe, pay attention to maybe four things, maybe even five to nine things at one time, and be great multitaskers. This very common belief is actually not true. What our brains do, um, as opposed to multitasking, is really task switching. We can switch our focus from one thing to another, and we can hold things in our working memory for a limited amount of time. But we don't necessarily pay attention to more than one thing at a time. We just move very quickly from focusing, paying attention to one thing as opposed to another. So what does this look like when we're studying? Let's pretend that we've been studying for a few hours and we've put in a lot of effort. But in the background, we have our music on. And your focus, your deep in concentration, your reading, you are bringing uh, information into your working memory, not just your short-term sensory store. You're paying attention to that information that you're reading or you're, that you're reviewing in your notes. But a song comes on. And you've heard the song already like three times today and you don't feel like listening to it again. And so you temporarily pull your working memory away, your consciousness away from the studying to change the song. Or maybe a song that you really like comes on and you start to sing the lyrics or hum the tune or you turn the volume up. And just very briefly, your working memory switches from the task at hand, the studying, to the music. What's the big deal? It's only a few seconds, right? We, we went right back to where we were. But unfortunately, that's not true. When you go back to the work, when you go back to your notes, when you go back to the book, what happens is you have to figure out where you left off. And this task switching, although very rapid, ultimately fatigues our executive control system, which is a very important component to our working memory. The executive control system is one of three components of the working memory and is very important to the way that we learn. This is where we process things consciously and we make meaning out of the information that we're attending to. The executive control system also organizes information and makes inferences about it in order to make the new information meaningful. This system also decides which information we'll attend to. It decides what's important to us and what's not, what we need to rehearse and keep for a little bit longer, or what isn't important at all and that even though it caught our attention briefly, we can let it go to memory loss and we don't need to process it any further. It also decides what information is going to get sent to long-term memory because it deems it so important that we'll need to retrieve it at a later time. The executive control system is a very important component to working memory, and it's especially important to learning. But again, can be very easily fatigued when there are several things that are vying for our attention and competing for that short duration and that small capacity that our working memory has. This piece of information about the executive control system is really important to us as learners. What it means is that we need to maximize our working memory by limiting the number of distractions. For example, if we're trying to study for an exam, if we are writing a paper or preparing for a presentation or a class discussion, we need to make sure that there are not other things that are fighting for our attention as we're trying to learn um, and make sense out of the information that's coming in. So this means we got to do the hard stuff, shutting our phones off so that we're not getting constant email pings or text messages, studying in the library where there are less distractions, less noise, um, less friends coming by knocking on our door wanting to hang out, shutting the music off or having music that doesn't have lyrics because language is complicated and will pull our attention away from what we're trying to learn. By maximizing the ability of our working memory, we're better able to ensure that the information that we're trying to learn is attended to, is processed meaningfully, and is organized so that when we need to retrieve it from our long-term memory, it will be available for us. Speaking of long-term memory, let's take a look at that next. Long-term memory, the promised land, the gold standard of memory. This is where learning occurs, and this is where we want the information that we're trying to learn to end up. But in order for it to be useful to us, we need to be able to bring it back into our working memory when we need it, either on a test or in a class discussion or when we're presenting. So how do we ensure that? What we need to do is we need to encode the information by making sense out of it based on what we know in our own personal experiences or previous knowledge. 
we need to organize the information, which means that we need to associate it with other information that we already know that will help lead us to the, the new information that we're learning. We need to encode it as opposed to just depositing it in the long-term memory. A good example or a good metaphor for this is think about when you were a kid and you really wanted to go play outside and your mom told you that you had to clean your room before you went outside. What did you do? Probably like most kids, you either took everything and threw it under your bed or stuffed it all in your closet. Now this is great because you got to run outside and play and your task was finished. Unfortunately, when you had to go back and find your toys, maybe you wanted to play with your G.I. Joe or your Barbie or, or whatnot, um, you had no idea where it was. You knew it was probably under your bed or in the closet, but to actually find the toy, you would probably have to take everything out of the closet or pull everything out from under your bed in order to find what you're looking for. Now think about this. If you're studying information and you're cramming everything in, instead of trying to take the time to organize it well and make sense out of it based on your previous knowledge, what will happen is that the information will just get stuffed in your long-term memory, like the toys got stuffed in the closet. And this means that the information is just being deposited. What happens in the next day when you're doing your presentation or you are taking the test is that you're not going to be able to retrieve the information. You're not going to be able to pull the information from your long-term memory and pull it into your working memory so that you can write it down or articulate it. And this is where the problem lies. When we study for hours or, or we study the whole day, the day before our test, but we just can't seem to remember what it is that we studied. One of two things occurred. Either the information just got crammed in and stored into our long-term memory and we're not able to retrieve it. Or it never got put into our long-term memory at all and the memory was actually lost. It just stayed in our working memory because we were repeating it, trying to memorize it. But instead of going into our long-term memory, it was just simply lost when we stopped thinking about it. So this begs the question, did we really forget what we learned or did we not learn it in the first place? So how do we maximize our working memory and ultimately support our long-term memory in being able to encode and retrieve information effectively? Well, we have to make sense of it. We have to organize it for ourselves and we have to take the burden off of our working memory in trying to remember a lot of unnecessary things. So you see here that we have a matrix. We have a representation or a graphic organizer that will help you remember the things that we just went over. There's a comparison of the three main components of the information processing system, the short-term sensory store, the working memory, and the long-term memory. And we're comparing the capacity and the duration of these three components. So here we've taken a lot of information that we had over the previous three slides, and we've brought it all onto one slide so that we can compare and contrast it and make sense out of it, see the relationships between these three components and how the capacity and duration of each varies. A few final questions to help you reflect on what you've learned in this lecture. What are you choosing to pay attention to? Are you maximizing your working memory capacity? What in your environment is distracting you? And what information are you able to retrieve after studying or practicing?